Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Area 312. I'm Rex and my co-host. Hi, I'm Kent. And friends, today our guest is a well-known guitarist, and he played uh, for the band Blood Good for over 30 years. Now he's a member of Les Carlson's band. Please welcome with me Paul Jackson. Hey, hey, Paul. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Great to be Thank here. Great to be here. Thank you. And Paul, you uh, you and Les and the band just had a concert on January 20th where you opened up for the Newsboys at the BMI Event Center. Um, how did that go um, with the Newsboys? Well, uh, <laughs> um, for those that are uh, familiar with Blood Good, um, we uh, you know, are a little bit of a different genre than the Newsboys. <laughs> mm -hmm. And... Uh, but I, I I was a little bit nervous about how that might come off with their crowd. Um, but, you know, every time I second guess uh, a show we would do, uh, the Lord would reveal why we're there, either mm -hmm. in the way that, uh, you know, somebody in the audience just needed to hear a message, um, whether it was a secular crowd or not. But, yeah, there, there was a time that we played uh, down in, I want to say, San Jose, and it was blood good. And I just had attitude all day long because <laughs> I was like, what are we doing? We're a Christian band. We're playing a bar. Um, it's, it was a huge bar. So it wasn't like a honky tonk or something, but it was, uh, you know, uh, they had a lot of uh, what I would call like medium sized tour acts that would come through. Um, and so I just had attitude because I didn't want to get up on stage and, and have resistance from a, a crowd, you know, that's rowdy and didn't, you know. So anyway, to make that a little shorter, I just went to Les and I go, who, who booked us here? Why are we here? And he goes, there's a reason for it. Trust me. He goes, everything's going to be fine. So right up until I went on stage, I was doubting why we would ever be there, you know. And we started playing and all of a sudden, you know, here comes the crowd and they're, yelling and having a great time and then there were people that were there uh, residual that were just there to see a band they didn't really know blood good that well and and uh it was a super fruitful night it it went great um and afterward i just apologized <laughs> i told michael and Les, i go i will not have that attitude again mm -hmm. you know and i don't know if it was after doing many many shows and i just had lost that warrior spirit or who knows i might have just woke up on the wrong side of the the floor <laughs> <laughs> well i heard i heard you guys uh performed never be the same that night we and did. I, i've always liked that song so uh, i wish i could have been there but i just couldn't make it happen paul but um i've always liked that song so that's cool that you guys did that yeah as a matter of fact i, I guess to even continue your original question since i went off on a tangent i uh i had a little bit of that um, revisiting of going and why. So we are still playing blood, blood, good material that Les and I wrote uh, mm -hmm. mainly. Um, and I'm like, I just don't know how crucify is going to go over with a newsboys crowd. I mean, these guys, this is not a heavy metal audience, right. you know? And so I started feeling that creep back in the back of my mind, that San Jose show. And I went, okay, put the brakes on. We're going to have a great time. We're going to play. There'll be some blood good fans. And then there'll be obviously a lot of the Newsboys fans. So I don't think I've played a show where I've been at more peace. You know, my wife asked me before I started, you know, the show, she's like, how are you feeling tonight? I go, feel great. She goes, you feel a little nervous or anything's bothering? I go, nope, feel fantastic. So we went up and we played and it was uh uh, more of a what you consider a soft uh, Christian rock type crowd. Yeah, I shouldn't say soft because the newsboys play rock. You know, it's not like they're up there playing like Liberace. You know, <laughs> but it was just different. And so we got about two thirds through the show, and and uh, we said, uh, "Who out there uh, has heard of Blood Good before?" And we, it was like, "Oh," <laughs> and then it's like, "Oh, okay, well." has anyone heard of uh, the less any of the less Carlson music? And it was no. And they're like, does anyone listen to heavy metal? You know, clap if you listen to heavy metal. And it was like, maybe a couple more. And 
And then uh, I got on the mic and I went, wow, are you guys patient? Because <laughs> they were so great. And then um, it really, I, I think, you know, if, if you take the attitude of just spreading the word of Christ, playing Christian music and all that, and see that you don't necessarily have to go in and if you're only playing to the people that know you or the people that are saved and, you know, uh, on, on their way, you know, in their Christianity and their walk, you really, it's just not that fruitful. It's a great time and it, and it's wonderful, but it's more like, um, you know, com camaraderie. My, uh, wife was sitting there with, uh, with Jeff, the drummer's wife, and uh, a lady came over and said, you guys look like you're with the band. Um, and they said, yeah, we're wives of so-and-so. And and the lady goes, I just want to tell you how much this show meant to me. Um, I brought my daughters along, and they absolutely loved your guys' performance. Uh, we're going to buy everything in your past catalog for Blood Good, and we're buying a record tonight. Um, one of the songs, I think it was Judas Kiss, uh, off Les's new album, said it spoke so poignantly to the the daughters that they they were just so happy because they they didn't bring them they brought them to see a Christian concert, but the daughters didn't know the Newsboys either, mm -hmm. and so but they they said this meant so much to us and our family, and we thank you so much. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but so the the it was one of that's just that thing I'm telling you about. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's out there. You don't know who's going to do. But I I think we gained a lot of uh, fans of the Newsboy crowd, um, and it just was a great experience. Uh, and so now our lesson Joyce just got done. They did the Chris Jericho cruise. Correct. Correct. And now we're going to write songs for the next record. Um, and so I have a meeting with those guys coming up to write with uh, Les and Joyce. And then we have uh, a tentative Northwest show, but we're really going to try to do the record, get ready, and then do... Uh, there's some opportunities in Europe for, you know, toward fall. Awesome. So that'll be the next, yeah. Well, and, and speaking of uh, fall, Paul... You know, I was at last year's Immortal Fest Part Two, and you you guys performed, um, and I could really tell the crowd. Of course, they they know you guys, they love you guys. They were really enjoying the show. If you can recall that far back, uh, what what was your impression <laughs> of that show? I know that was quite a while ago now, but um, I really thought it was an incredible show. Yeah, it, it went so well, and um, you know, we really had a a real shattered life after michael passed you know mm -hmm. and we just weren't sure what was going on you know is there going to be a continuation of blood good mm -hmm. is or is are we going to use some of the songs that les and i were writing at the time and he was writing to um go that direction maybe meanwhile while michael's healing will put out you know a record uh and so there were just all kinds of question marks going on and so uh um when we regrouped uh and we were gonna go go forward with making Lassa's record and all that, um you know, we decided to do that show and we I think that was the first show Juan was playing bass. Is is that was that uh, who was playing bass? It wasn't Ricky at the I, time do you remember i think you're right paul i think so but i'm not i'm that, not exactly sure i, I wouldn't say 100 percent, but i think you're right yeah and um and he just uh he's been a great addition and the show that uh, we just did now i'm trying to think if Juan played that show before because i'm trying to think of if no i believe he did so anyway, he's the new bass player, really awesome guy. So the lineup with he, he and Jeff just click really well. So that was the first thing that we played because we did a show before that mm -hmm. um, with a different bass player. And it was really pretty fresh after Michael had, you know, been, you know, had his brain bleed and had been, you know, in rehab. And that just felt almost, it just felt like maybe we rushed to do a show. It was a little too soon. Sure. And, 
and I think it showed. I don't think the performance was that good. But um, the last Immortal Fest, I think this uh, lineup that we have right now is really super solid. Mm -hmm you know and i love supporting less you know yeah right <laughs> i really do we, we've been so close for so long um but yeah i think i think that went really well and i think the next one will will be able to um play some even new material which will oh, be nice awesome yeah cool. Well, we're kind of going to go back to the beginning now, Paul, and I, I think I already know the answer to this question, but I'm going to let you answer it. But growing up, was music part of your family? Um, you know, it's kind of a loaded question, but um, and we're going to get to that. But I just want to know uh, how was things growing up in your family with music? Yeah, so my dad uh, played uh, music, actually. He started because he he uh, grew up in Tennessee, and uh, back in that day, which was was quite a while ways ago, um, you would pretty much shoot what you're going to have for dinner. <laughs> so tonight's possum all the king, mm -hmm. and tomorrow's blackbird. You know, uh, with a side of okra or whatever they eat. Back side then. of buckshot. <laughs> side of buckshot. Yeah, just pick it out of your teeth. Uh, but so he had a friend of his that had a guitar and he it just, he was like, gosh, I'd love to have a guitar. And he goes, well, I'll trade you for your rifle. So he traded him, learned how to play. And so he played on all those like hay rides and, and circuits back then, same circuits as like, uh, Loretta Lynn and, and all those people. And then he, uh, when he went in the army, he got stationed out in Tacoma, Washington, and then uh, right out of the army, uh, he started playing, you know, kind of same circuit, New Buck Owens and all those guys. And then he had a TV show uh, here. Um, and so I grew up with, you know, watching my dad on playing and, you know, our TV and and he had instruments laying all over the house. And uh, so I well, you know, we didn't have Nintendo, so I was really bored. And so I started beating around on the, the drum kit that was there. And this is after they're not there. I don't think they would have liked this. Uh, but then I'm banging around the keyboards and toying around with the guitar. And so when they were, because my dad really wasn't a fan of the industry and didn't want me to get, you know, he didn't want me to play. Um, he just thought it was kind of a dead end road full of sorrow if you get into the, if you get any good at it, you know. But I, uh, that kind of made me want to do it more because I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to listen. Um, <laughs> so um, by the time he figured out I had been doing this, I was already able to play, you know. And I learned everything by ear. And he didn't he didn't show me anything because then I would have gave up my cover. Um, and then, uh, funny enough, is uh, I think that I was probably about six or seven years old. Um, but I didn't really start playing, playing until I was about 12 years old and I got an electric guitar and then I spent a whole summer learning, uh, the Kiss Destroyer record. And let me tell you, I wore out a couple records cause I had to learn by picking up the needle and dropping it and mm -hmm. picking it up and dropping it and learning by ear. So um i'd say i went from being able to kind of poke around on a guitar to being able to play pretty much everything on that record in a summer but i dedicated myself wow. it was every day like it was a job mm -hmm. you know and then after that it was just there you go and then but like i said by the time i my dad found out i was doing it then um it was too late he's like well here you go you're already good so i guess we'll just let well, it go well, and then, Paul, along those same lines, when did your journey with Christ begin? 
So my brother and I used to volunteer when we were probably about that same age about that I started doing the KISS record, <laughs> learning that. We were about 10, 11 years old, volunteered at a nursing home down the road from our house. And uh, so we would go in and feed elderly people um, or just take them in wheelchairs to the lunchroom and back and stuff. Um, and we just ride our bikes there and do that. And uh, I can remember her name. Her name was Mrs. Glass. And she was the, the lady that ran the nursing home. And she said, do you mind helping out? We're going to take uh, some people. We're going to take a, a shuttle of people over to the church and and then go to church. And I was, and my brother and I went to Baptist church. Our parents would drop us off and, and we would go there uh, semi-regularly. So I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So I went along and then I was sitting there and it was the day that the pastor did an altar call. And it says, you know, that thing they'll get you every time when they're like, do you feel you know, like something's tugging at you to come up here and do that. I'm like, oh man, yeah, I I felt like a serious tug, you know. And so I went up and and uh, you know, from that day forward, I was like, I'm I'm committed to having Christ in my life. And I was a uh, I read the Bible every morning or every night, you know. And uh, I just I just felt that that was going to be part of my life going forward. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that was kind of where that started. Okay, cool. Well, uh, one of your bands, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, is it called Boibs? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting because some of those members went on to form or be in Pearl Jam and some other bands. Um Yeah. How did that all, how how did that band come about and how did that go? Well, it's bizarre because um, we were all, we all lived in Gig Harbor and people now look back at it that are in the kind of region as the Gig Harbor effect. <laughs> because for some strange reason, a little teeny fishing town has people that went on to play in Alice in Chains, Mother Love Bone, Pearl Jam, um guns and roses uh you know just all blood good let's not forget the biggest group of all those yeah. no, i'm just kidding but uh and then uh, other places there's other people that are that came out and and uh have done some amazing things authors uh all kinds of stuff but it's really weird um because a lot of us grew up on the same street mm -hmm. and so to to have somebody on your street be in the rock and roll hall of fame and and uh christian rock hall of fame and you know all these different things it's it's just really bizarre because i mean you guys probably know the odds of even doing well enough to even sustain a living playing music is really minute mm -hmm. you know it's when people say oh i write and i play in a band they go oh cool what do you do for work <laughs> yeah exactly well, then how, how did you come to meet um, Michael and Les? How did that happen? Um, it's funny because these guys are actually proud of this, but I get a little embarrassed over it. <laughs> but I was playing in a band that was, the, well, Boibs, as you know. That that band uh, was like one of the first new wave bands in the Northwest, Seattle area and all that. And um, we... Uh, we're getting pretty popular regionally. So we'd play a lot in Canada, Oregon, uh, Washington, and uh, we uh, needed a, a replacements for our road crew that we had because a couple of guys went on, believe it or not, that one of the guy, our road manager, wound up being one of the people, uh, one of the bigger people with uh, Northern Exposure, that TV show. Mm -hmm. So, um, he didn't live in Gig Harbor, though, so he doesn't count. But um, <laughs> so uh, the manager came in and sat down with us and said, OK, guys, I found a couple guys. One's going to do your sound. One's going to do your lights. But I want to warn you ahead of time that uh, there are Christians. And I'm like, well, there's no problem with that. You know, I was just like um, and then he said, no, but they're they're like the real hardcore Jesus Christians. So I already warned them not to 
tell you guys a bunch of stuff and try to get you guys going to just kind of do their job and and that's it when you're done the gig's over they go home and so um les likes to talk about it but he and mike used to bring us ice water to the stage and get all of our stuff set up and just be servants you know and they, they always say they were just roadies for me you know <laughs> um so but one night we were playing an out of town gig and les said hey we're looking at doing this band and um i'd really like to write a song with you and i said okay sure and so i'm in this room and he came up to the room and we wrote demon on the run and uh it was fun but i really thought yeah exactly man you're prepared <laughs> i'll stand together go no i'm just kidding <laughs> what did you say paul i didn't hear you i go i go i'll stand together go oh, oh, give me one second <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> All Jackson, this is your life. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's kind of how it started, you know, okay. and uh, that would have been about 85-ish. And th they think they did their first demo with all that stuff around 86, so the first record. Um, and then uh, it, it turned out really good. And so that was kind of the beginning of... Uh, regular writing with less so um and we wouldn't write much but what we wrote wound up being good i mean god blessed it i mean he really did because i did on the first three records i did demon on the run yep. and then i did uh crucify mm -hmm. yep there you go seven. and then yep and then seven gosh that's man now i know why you're here you're like the mastermind yep and then that was uh, all out of the dark this was my first full-fledged yes. um you know writing partnership for the the whole album and performing it yeah Both and then that ones. one that one's my fault because <laughs> i like that album a lot and we'll talk about that okay okay Paul, I want your fans, our viewers, to know that you've been with the band since that first album. Uh, yes. As you mentioned, you co-wrote Demon on the Run with Less, and then you had a hand in writing Crucify and Seven, all from the first three albums before you officially came into the fold for Out of the Darkness. Um, you wrote a bulk of all the other material uh, along with the band. I'd like to ask at this juncture then, uh, with regard to David Zafiro's departure after Rock in a Hard Place, did did they audition you for lead guitarist, or did they just kind of know that you were the one based upon your past interaction with the band? How did all that take place? Um, yeah, so when Dave, you know, gave him the notice that, hey, you know, I'm going to have to to leave the band um Les called me right away and asked my interest level in it um and then we just started rehearsing and writing yeah there wasn't an audition process um although they should have done that just to get back at me for them being my roadies for a while they should have put me through the rigors but they didn't um and it was funny because I mean it's, it was just another god thing because you know started off really loving rock i mean i that kiss record uh chris or kiss then segued to thin lizzie that segued into aerosmith then ted nugent um that i just started really getting into all of it and learning everything i could you know <clears throat> and then that was an easy transition into van halen and van halen just kind of changed the life of most guitarists excuse me because everybody just was in love as soon as they heard the first van halen song and so i went from van halen then to duran duran 
<laughs> the natural transition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, so they knew that I had it in me. You know, they knew that that was well, kind of already bred in. Even even though I was playing new wave music, um, they they knew it. But I did go from new wave to metal. So I went they, rock, new wave metal. They knew you were hungry like the wolf. I mean, you know. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Well, well, After all, I'm from planet Earth. What do you expect? <laughs> hey oh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, and and like with writing a song on those first three albums, you're a little bit like a fifth member of the band already and writing. And so, like you said, they already, you know, you already had experience with how they were and how they work and write and so it probably was pretty much a no-brainer just to see what your interest was to to uh, start after David left. Yeah, and i i'd, I'd been uh, I'd been in negotiations with Steve Miller Band uh, to go on tour with them, and uh, when that fell through, it was a really weird situation. But um, right before we were going to start rehearsals for the tour. Uh, he ran into his old guitar player from the Abracadabra record. And he said that he was in, f falling on hard times and he was out of a gig because he was playing with the tubes and that, that gig ended. He said, is there any way I can get on with you? We can play like old times. And they were really good friends. And I got a phone call that said, sorry, buddy, it's a weird deal, but you're, you're out. And so um, I was coming off that downer and Les gave me a call and said, Hey, I don't know what you're doing lately. You're probably busy, but we're going to, you know, do a record. David's left and we'd like to have you come in and do it with us. So I think maybe God, I think it was uh, from him because I think if I went that route and did six months of, you know, touring with that and then doing this, it probably would have led to another tour. And I don't know if my walk would have been as strong. I don't know if it would have been, you know, I just don't think it would have been a good life for me. You know, I'm I'm a mama's boy. You know, I need my friends. I need, you know, my my Lord. I need that foundation. I don't know how I would have done, you know, gallivanting across the country playing and being in that that uh, world. That world's a world that you a lot of people don't survive. And I would have hated to at the time I was crushed, though, because it was a lot of money and it was a lot of exposure and endorsements and secular recognition and guitar player magazine and all those things that come with that. Um, but, you know, it would, have it's that butterfly effect, you know, <laughs> and uh, maybe I was more like a moth, but, it, but it's still, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you that it would have been good for me, but um, if it would have followed the stereotypical life of, secular people it probably wouldn't have been good for me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well and if i can ask paul I, I i'm if you can always push the that pass button but you had a pretty serious health event uh, i can't remember if it was in the 80s or early 90s um but it's a wonderful testimony if you're willing to talk a little bit about that or not um oh of course like, yeah would like i would like everyone to hear this because it's an incredible story yeah, uh, so uh, there was an interim between the Boibs and Bloodgood. And right after I'd met Les and Michael, and we'd done probably a year's worth of shows. I mean, that band, the Boibs, we we played 320 dates out of 365 days. So I, we were a real working band. Um, when I left that band... Uh, then Michael and Les, uh, in a, another parallel world to what to me, were getting hot and into what doing what they were doing and doing uh, metal missionaries and all that. It was when that was kind of starting. Um, I went in for a checkup because I was having some breathing issues, uh, and so my mom was like, "Hey, you should probably go see an allergist and find out if you've got asthma or something. If you're having trouble breathing, that's that's probably a good way to where to you know place start." So I go in, allergist checks out, he's listening to my chest. He goes, nice and clear. Why don't you blow into this, you know? And uh, it was like a breath measurer, not a breathalyzer. Hmm? Let's get that straight. Okay. Um, <laughs> so he goes, yeah, your capacity is not very good. He goes, 
but I am hearing a weird murmur in your heart. He goes, clear lungs, not very much volume of oxygen. He goes, I'm going to have to send you to a heart specialist. I, there may be something there that's, you know, that's causing your breathing problems. So I leave from the allergist uh, to go to the heart doctor. I go to the heart doctor. He gets me set up with an ultrasound and he goes in. He's one of the best guys in, in Tacoma. And um, he does it. He goes, okay, well, your heart's beating great. Everything looks really strong, except there seems to be a pretty decent sized shadow. Um, he goes, that's all I can really see in there. He goes, could be, you know, something that's just uh, swollen out of whack, you know, something that could be fixed. Uh, but he goes, I'm going to have to refer you to an uh, oncologist. And so... Um, so he got me set up and this is all within a day. I, you couldn't do that nowadays. They'd say like, looks like you're going to die. Why don't we make an appointment for March? You know, yeah. <laughs> I hope you yeah. make it. Right. But, um, no, so I was right off. Uh, so it's, the whole thing started about eight o'clock in the morning. Now it's about four in the afternoon and I'm in an oncology office. And so they do a CAT scan and he comes back, he goes, yeah, I'm sorry to tell you, you've got a, a grapefruit sized tumor. And I don't know why they always use fruits, but I guess it makes sense. I would have preferred it to be a kiwi, you know, <laughs> but it was, uh, but it could have been a pineapple. <laughs> but anyway, so grapefruit sized tumor, he goes, it's right between your uh, one lung and your heart, which makes sense with my diminished capacity for air, you know, that I've trying to breathe up against a, a, few, a piece of fruit. But, um, so then when they saw that, you know, the guy said, uh, we'll set you up with a biopsy as soon as possible and go in and uh, we're gonna have to cut out a piece of rib. Um, I always tease Faith, you know, my wife that I'm like, you know, Adam gave up one, I gave up one and like a quarter, you know, so I sacrificed more. Um, <laughs> but uh, so he goes, um, you're either going to wake up and have a, a little incision and it's going to be cancer or you're going to wake up with an open heart surgery and we removed it. And so, um, I woke up from surgery and the first thing I did is look down and I went, Oh, crud. Cause it wasn't a uh, incision down my chest. It was a little one. So I, I knew what was going on. Um, but, uh, you know, during the process of that surgery, Les Carlson, you know, and I hadn't seen him really since we wrote the song, you know, that they were doing their first album with, but he came in and prayed over me while I was uh, sedated. And, you know, they set up my arrangement for, uh, they were going to do radiation therapy. And so he did, um, the doctor said, you know, this is something that we're going to try first and then we'll do chemotherapy as a follow-up and then we'll look at that point and see maybe if it gets small enough we can then maybe remove as much as we can but right now it's so big we can't even take it out of your body so let's let's do 25 treatments of radiation try to get it down in and uh so we did one treatment went in and did a, a ct a cat scan and he pulled it up and he goes let me show you what's going on here because i'm not sure i understand what i'm looking at I'm like, oh, aren't you the doctor? You don't know what you're looking at. But uh, <laughs> he pulled he pulled it up, and I'm like, I don't I don't see I don't see what I'm supposed to be looking at. And he goes, Well, that's because it's gone. He goes, it, it's gone. He goes, I've never seen anything like that before. And I know that you know Les was there. My mom had all kinds of churches praying over and all that. And he said it was basically like us uh, microwaving butter you know? And so I wound up doing that. Uh, and it was pretty amazing that, uh, um, that they had that reaction and the doc, the doctor just said, it's nothing short of a miracle. And so, <laughs> sorry, I'm shifting uh, gears. That's all right. yeah. Um, but yeah. And so at, at that point, you know, it was pretty obvious, you know, that when that C. Miller operation you know, fell through and Les gave me the call that I'm like, Oh, I get it. He has, uh, he has something else for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
to do. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I never mind saying that story because um, the piece of the puzzle that was the most poignant and significant is after that first treatment, then that night I was in bed and I uh, was asleep and I was woken up and it was an intense feeling like I, I, I could never describe it because it was, I was just engulfed in this energy and basically blinded by the light, you know, like Manfred man. And uh, <laughs> um, I was literally <laughs> written by Bruce Springsteen, though. I don't want to. It was, watch. yes. After um, a little but, loose coop. Yes. Another runner and in so, the light. Yeah. I'm glad you know the real words because people think they do. And they're like, oh, <laughs> well, that's a funny way to say it, but that isn't it. Escape from the fire. Man, I, I talked. I told that out of order. Can you edit it so the light part happens before the, the <laughs> X-ray? That's up to Kent. <laughs> you, you, you would think I would be better at this. Oh no! <laughs> so let's get fun. this better. Found out <laughs> I had cancer. Had the treatment. Oh no! Yes, had the treatment that night. Uh, absolutely. I, I thought I was dying um because i didn't know what that feeling is i never had it before so i went oh well there you go i uh, i'm dying uh because i couldn't i couldn't talk uh while this was going on it was almost like you picture like a close encounters thing where the beam comes down and zaps him and brings him into space you know um but uh yeah i, I wanted to yell out because i was staying at my parents and i wanted them to you know save me i'm i'm dying you know um and so, uh, you know, my mom finally, it's kind of like, I'm trying to yell and all of a sudden it's like, ah, <laughs> and my mom comes in, she's like, what's wrong? And I go, something happened to me, something weird happened. And my bed was soaking wet, you know, um, which hadn't happened since I was at least probably 10. No, I'm just kidding. Or was just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so she goes, oh, honey, you just had a bad dream. You're okay. I went, no, 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 it was light. It was, it was energy. It was crazy. I, I couldn't speak. I couldn't do anything. And then she's like, well, that must've been God, hon. And I'm like, oh. and I, I tried to explain it away until I went to the doctor the next day and he pulls up the x-ray and he goes, your cancer's gone. And the moral I mean, of the story is you can't, you can't out doctor the great physician. Absolutely. He created everything. He knows how to fix it. He does. You know, and, and I got to be honest with you guys. I've told the story quite a few times. Um, the one thing I don't mention is how much guilt I felt. You know, um, I, I, well, one of my brother's friends had leukemia and died um, right at, not too long after that. Uh, I've had several friends pass away. I've had several people I know, uh, relatives and friends that have died. And, and I, and that's the one thing about being, uh, you know, touched by the Lord and having something like a miracle happen is you, you carry a little survivor's guilt, you know, and, uh, I pray for people that have passed. I prayed for Michael so hard. I think I lost my voice and, and my abs felt like I'd been throwing up all night. I prayed so hard for him to live. And uh, and he didn't, you know. Paul, and uh, so. If I may, you're getting me to think about something. If I may uh, speak what's on my heart then. You know, all of us, before we were in the womb, the Lord says he, you know, he knows us. And he has a purpose for each one of us. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves. Um, here's a for instance. 
true story. In 2017, my dad was in a motorcycle accident and he didn't survive here on earth. But he's been with the Lord Jesus ever since then. And we have to ask ourselves, and I'm not making up, I'm not blowing smoke here. It's either God is either real or he's not. His word is either true or it's a lie. There's no middle ground. And I'm going to quote, ironically, <laughs> the one Wayne Watson song, easy listening Christian stuff, but it stuck with me because it's true because it measures up with the word. Who really has the ultimate healing? Hmm. My dad was ultimately healed in yeah. 2017. In April of 2017, he lived a week at Baptist Hospital where he was at. He was on a ventilator. They had pamphlets out about brain damage and stuff. And I remember my brother talking to me because my dad was an avid hunter and all this stuff. And he went to be with the Lord Jesus. And my brother told me, he said, you know, the, you know, because my dad knew Jesus. And he said, I'm glad that dad went home. He's ultimately healed because here it wouldn't have been any kind of life. He yeah. Didn't hunt anymore. So I, does all that make sense what I'm trying to say? And it's not a bad answer. God's, I mean, you know, when we go home to be with the Lord, like, like the Lord tells us in Revelation, there's no more sorrow or tears or crying or pain. We cross that finish line and life has just started for the Christian. So death yeah. is nothing more than the birth canal for the yeah. So thank you. I'm sorry, Paul. Thank you for allowing me to share my heart. No, I, I love that. It was funny because uh, as you were saying that, um, you know, with, with Michael, uh, blood good, that, that is what, uh basically released that for me you know i mean great guy i mean i don't know if you can have a cleaner life existent marry your high school sweetheart one love uh not a drinker not a smoker um a pastor um but i agree with you after you know the accident you know um a freak thing. I mean, we just played that show. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one thing that Michael said to me, and we're standing there, we're talking to the, the crowd and we're signing some autographs, is he looked over and he goes, you know what? I don't think I remember my signature. And I laughed at him because Michael's got a beautiful signature mm -hmm. and he's been doing it for mm -hmm. 35, 40 years. You know, and I'm like, oh, come on, dude. You know, I was being funny, but, and then he started signing. It was all good. But that was the only indicator to me. And when I look back and go, I wonder if that was something going on. Cause it was the next day, I believe next morning, next afternoon that he had, you know, that he collapsed with that brain bleed. And, uh, um, but as he was, making the slow road to recovery, we didn't know where he was going to get to, you know, was he going to make a enough recovery to be able to preach or even play the bass or, or do whatever. And he had a long period of time that he was able to talk and spend time with his family that a lot of people don't get, you know, uh, months, you know, but when, when he succumbed to, you know, being, too sick to actually withstand any kind of uh, additional illnesses, you know, during recovery. Um, that's what I thought too. I, I, I agree with you. I think that Michael, you know, got the biggest embrace and pat on the back and, and definitely the, the world, especially with where, where it is right now, you guys know that this place is, it's like people are, it's like we're in a hurry to have it wrecked. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, let's let evil take over the world, but let's mm -hmm. make it snappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, it, and so he, Michael is in a great place. Kevin's in a great place. I mean, I, I really had a string of hits and it's in like, you probably felt with, with your father. We love him. We want him here. I want to hang out with Michael right now. I miss him. I love him. And, uh, 
But is it the best thing for them? Absolutely not. It's not the best thing for any of us. Paul, you know? I'd like to ask if you don't mind, and you painted a, a picture for us of the wonderful Michael Bloodgood, whom we've all respected and loved. And, you know, I was also a fan of Watchmen uh, on the road. Oh, yeah. Account. And uh, picked up, you know, when I first heard uh, Fear No Evil off a compilation, I picked up the Watchmen tape and the subsequent tape generation. And I was a fan of them. And I knew Kevin Whistler was in that band. If you don't mind, Paul, at this juncture, since we talked about Michael, would you paint us a picture of Kevin so that we can kind of get to know the person he was? Absolutely. If you've seen the documentary, I got to be honest, that's not the Kevin Whistler I loved. <laughs> uh, he was very, uh, what do you want to say, um, businesslike in those interviews. And Kevin was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, he would, he had these impressions that he would do and we would just crack each other up like crazy, but he would take his t-shirt and pull it over his head. And then he would do a f imitation of a fly, you know, um, <laughs> He would do uh, hilarious impressions and uh one time he was bouncing up and down on a ramp that was really flexible they were loading in our pa gear and we just gotten out of the um the, the rv and we're checking the venue out and he goes check the spring out on this and he's bouncing up and down and he didn't see that as the ramp was going into the door that the steel door jam was above his head so he went like bounce but and he just literally <laughs> hit his head so hard and he fell on his butt on the ramp you know and i go are you okay and he goes yeah except for i've got this junior mint on my head <laughs> and it was like the size of a junior mint uh, bump on his head and he was just hilarious um but you know kevin and i knew we ran around the same circle because when i was in the boibs he was in a band called The Names. And when he left The Names and eventually he wound up in Watchmen, I left The Boys. eventually wound up in Bloodgood. Um, and we had a common friend with Greg Sweet. Um, and Greg Sweet actually and I wrote a song uh, for uh, uh, Dangerously Close, I Will. That, that's uh, Greg Sweet and I's song. And we actually play that in concert now, which is, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and Greg passed away as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as Kevin, Kevin was just a super convicted, loving friend, um, would do anything for you. A great husband uh, to Elaine. Um, that was a tough one for me. Uh, and I had no idea, you know, that you can probably see pictures that pop every now and then of Kevin's funeral and his drum set was set up and on stage and then they did a whole kind of memorial video and with the blood good stuff and then we had to get up and say a few words um man by the time it was time to talk i was kind of mentally done you know um yeah it was uh it was a real oh, tough one he, good good man real good man and then i had no idea less than a year later i'm looking at michael mm -hmm. you know just a succession. My, my mother passed away uh, a year ago in November. Um, there's all kinds of trials, you mm -hmm. know. But again, Kevin, I'm fortunate enough that Kevin, Michael, my mother, I mean, just lovely people with great hearts for God. Um, so it, it truly is just the earthly sadness that we have. But mm -hmm. if you know Christ and you, Christ is just waiting. He's waiting, you know. Good job. Well done. Welcome in. <laughs> the good shepherd. The good well, shepherd. And you were speaking of Dangerously Close, um, Paul, you know, that was released in 2013. And, you know, we have Oz Fox from Striper um, yeah. on that record. Um, how was it to have another guitarist, you know, in the band or recording the record? 
Um, and how how was that with having Oz in in the mix? Awful, he's a real jerk. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I love Oz. Uh, I, I was, a, you know, a Striper fan. I mean, mm -hmm. not just lip service stuff. I mean, I was one of those guys that called in when they were having like, who's the, what's the most popular MTV metal video? And when mm -hmm. Calling On You was on there, I'm like, I'm calling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I and uh, so when Michael... Uh, he got together with Oz doing, I think, a speaking engagement in England or something like that. Um, so he was, uh, when I was told that he was interested in doing something, I was in, totally in. As a matter of fact, I fanboyed when, as soon as we were, you know, getting together to write, um, Oz was like, well, I'm going to take my, at the time he had this black Mustang, he goes, I'm going to take my car because we just got flown, flew in. He goes, does anybody want to ride with me? I'm like, yes, me. I'm over here. <laughs> He's like, oh, great, man. Come on in. So, yeah, we we became friends so fast. Um, the same day, you know, we go into his room and, and uh, we're writing stuff together and playing guitar. And I had no idea that he loved my guitar playing. And, and I obviously loved his, you know, for a long time. And uh, so... Man, I was just so excited to do it. I and he became such a good friend of mine, and you know, I can call him at any given time. That guy will pick up, mm -hmm. you know. Hey, man, what's going on? I'm I'm actually on stage, getting ready to play. You know, I mean, he he just is that kind of guy, you know. And then he's Uncle Oz to our kids because he come over and makes pancakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and he's he's just a, he's a good man. I love traveling with him. You know. It was right before Striper got busy again, you know, and they signed a new management deal and, yeah. and that whole thing. So he, uh, you know, unfortunately couldn't continue doing it. Um, but every time Striper is anywhere around, I'll go and I'll have dinner with Michael and he and whoever else wants to go. And we'll go out to dinner before the show. And cool. And so, yeah, it was great. I, I uh, we had that mutual admiration society where it's like, oh, you're really good. Oh, you're really good. Oh, my gosh. You know. <laughs> that's neat that's neat well you, you do work with Les on on his new album he's coming that came out in late 2022 how many songs did you um write with less on that um wow. it's a great question i'd have to <laughs> look at it it's okay i well I, I i know the last song i believe joyce and someone else worked on but i think you, yeah. you worked on quite a few how about i want to know you yes faith is tested yes he's coming that sounds right. Because those have your names out beside them along with Liz. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. See, and it was a funny thing for me because I kind of co-produced that with Les too. So mm -hmm. he brought me songs that he's like, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And like with uh, Joyce's song that she wrote with Craig, you know, yeah. I had that idea. It was a very uh, Avenged Sevenfold guitar vibe in mm -hmm. the beginning that has that riff. Mm -hmm. So I added that riff and then just kind of helped them arrange the songs. So I get lost in which ones I arranged and which ones I came up with, you know, music for riffs. But in all honesty, uh, Les had just got into playing guitar and he was really, he lived and breathed a guitar and he got really good at coming up with stuff. I really wanted to just see what he could do. Okay, You know, I've mm -hmm. written a lot of stuff with him. I really wanted to see what he could do and see how I could help him see his vision through to a good song and i don't think i ruined too many of them i think i came up with some pretty good stuff it's a great um, album yeah yeah it's so great you get i'll tell you what like he he did river river is his tune mm -hmm. and other than helping him arrange uh and do some uh you know producing on it he came up with those chords i never would have played those chords never 
they kind of defy, they kind of bend your ear a little bit in the, mm-hmm. the verses. Mm-hmm. I would never have done that. And um, so, you know, when it came down to the end, he goes, I wanted to start small and go huge. Then I came up with that ending section with the guitar builds. So it starts off, it's just a rhythm. Then it has a simple arpeggio. Then it has a little bit of it. So it just, let, I think we probably have six, seven, eight guitars that are on top of each other without getting in each other's way too much. That was kind of what we wanted. We wanted to have a wall of, of guitar build and then a, a really simple solo. So I never could really go off on it because it didn't call for it. I mean, you know, not everything you need to to do every pyrotechnic that you know. Play to the and, song, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ca- yep. Cater to what it's calling for. And there's a lot of stuff where he goes, do this. And I'm like, it doesn't need it. It's already good. The way you got it's good. Don't need it. You know? And I think uh, as I matured as a guitarist, you know, I went from seeing just how fast and technically good I could be to going, how little can I play and have it be good? You know, I want a solo where people can remember it or hum it or whatever, because Faith, her favorite album is All Stand Together. And she can, she's a great singer. Faith is great. She was, uh, she did American Idol. You know, she's fantastic. She's a fantastic gospel singer. We did a Christmas record uh, together that uh, Les sells out of his like kind of collection. Um, but anyway, uh, so she sings so much of that album's guitar solos and riffs and some of the little production pieces. She just loves that aspect. And I'm going, gosh, I really do want to play for everybody that's not just a, a guitar player, mm-hmm. you know. So it became less important for me to be flashy and more important for me to be memorable. Yes, Kent, you had a question? Well, I'd like to ask two quick questions, if I could, Paul. Since you mentioned All Stand Together, I right in front of that, I want to ask a quick question about uh, Out of the Darkness and then one about All Stand Together. Now, to me, as, as a longtime Blood Good fan since the first album, uh, when this album was released, to my listening experience, it took the pop sensibilities of Rock in a Hard Place and it blended in the harder roots of the first two albums. So, Paul, do, do you recall any discussions? Were there any discussions about the band direction prior to going into this album's recording? Or was this just the songs as they worked themselves out and what you guys were laying down? Yeah, so no preconceived thought of what we were going to do. Um, uh, it, it was super organic. Um, the songs, they all work together really well for some reason, you know. And then All Stand Together is was different. That one was uh, music I was listening to at the time and was really a fan of. I love the band Giant. I know they yeah. didn't get very big as far as the world, but Dave Huff and mm-hmm. Dan Huff, his brother, did an amazing job. Uh, Dan Huff is one of my all-time favorite guitar players, uh, will always be. Um, and so I was lucky enough because listening to that record, I just told Les and Mike, I go, this is the direction I want to go. This is where I want to write. And they kind of told me, they're like, if this is a flop, it's kind of on you. (laughs) And I went, oh, great. Um, and it, it turned out there was a lot of controversy over it. There were a lot of the detonation fans that said, well, this is getting too commercial and too soft and, and all that. But then we also, as life has it, we picked up a lot of people. Uh, when we went to play Germany, uh, after that record came out, every audience member knew every lyric to every song we played. And so it really took off over there. Uh, not as much over here. You know, Um, the nice thing is I Want to Live in Your Heart wound up getting played a bit um, because it was radio friendly for people that wouldn't play uh, Crucify, you know. Uh, But yeah, that one was a little bit of a stab for the band, but I was super comfortable and I was like, trust me, it's going to be cool. Well, so I've always enjoyed this album a whole lot, just like I've enjoyed Rock in a Hard Place. And Mm -hmm. Rock in a Hard Place was commercial. Blood Good wasn't metal. It was, this was a hard rock out, meaning Blood Good was metal, but they went went to hard rock. This was radio friendly. 
as was this album. Uh, um, my question, I guess, regarding All Staying Together, Paul, because I think it's a very good album. There's a lot of hooks in there. Uh, it's just good yeah. music. And so Thanks. I would love to see it remastered, though. I wish it would get a, a good remastering job to it uh, just to kind of beef up, you know, some of the limitations back then. So two questions. Is there any chance that this might could be remastered? Because I know like David Zafiro remastered Detonation. Um, yeah. Could this be remastered? Has there been any talks about it among the oh, yeah. among your camp? Yeah, that that is going to happen. Uh, I, I believe that that if I if I have this right, I think David's already gotten most of it done. Um, I don't know what the plan is on the releasing side. Um, I know that there's uh, got to be uh, some agreement between uh, the Bloodgood family mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that everything's put in place and that they're they're totally happy with it. Uh, we even recut some of the songs um, with Oz playing guitar. Oh. Uh, on some of it just to get a different feel and then we minimized some of the uh keyboards and added more guitar uh to make it a little bit edgier um and then even pulled off some of the big choir background vocals to simplify it so we have a couple different versions i'd like to re-release the record like you said remastered and then have bonus tracks of the ones with oz on there so people can see that so mm -hmm. um yeah so there are plans awesome i am so glad to hear that because it's a very <laughs> underrated album you were talking about kiss earlier even kiss had dynasty and unmasked and it's pure pop confection so it's right my last question then about this paul is why was this the band's last studio album until dangerously close did blood good take a hit due to the grunge movement which came um, the, the problem with that, I'm not really sure. I think it's because it had just dis different distribution in Europe, but our, we signed with a, a label called Maranatha, um, which were super famous for doing, um, worship music, you know? So it was a risk on their part to take on bands, you know, uh, it turned out it was so much of a risk that they couldn't handle it. So they basically shelved it. Um, and so we, we, you know, I think it was a little being disheartened that it was kind of uh, dropped and then it was a real problem trying to get it back from them so we could release it on our own with, through a different channel. Um, and so I think the mostly the discouraging part was uh, feeling like we were really onto something. We had a really big budget and we had video, but we had all kinds of stuff going our way and it just didn't go. And so Michael and I were wondering, uh, I don't know what Les was doing. He might've been sleeping in, but we were in Sweden and we were sitting there um, and Michael's, we were starting to feel like maybe it was being forced and it wasn't God doing it. And that we were trying to push it super hard. Um, I didn't want to not play anymore. I didn't realize that, um, that that was going to bring on a hiatus, uh, but I do know that, it, you know, finding the right label at the time, and I, I don't think the grunge movement helped, even though my friends were doing it, it helped them a lot. Um, but I don't think it helped us because um, I think it made it less, uh, less options for labels that were interested in picking up, you know, metal. Um, a lot of bands, I mean, most bands from that didn't survive I mean, um, that movement. Um, but I think it was supposed to be just like kind of a let's regroup, let's see what where God takes us, let's pray hard and see what doors open. And I think it went from that to just just the patient, you know. We stayed talking with all of each other, we love each other, and we're doing that. And I'd occasionally come over and write with Michael at his house and all that, but um, there wasn't any traction until about 2003 or four. Um, and then we do some things and then uh and we did some touring with oz uh one-off dates in and out of here and doing that and so it really wasn't uh until we're like we got to do a record we got oz with us let's let's do this um and i really wanted to produce a blood good record i mean be the producer of the record and um all the shots and all that and i'll tell you what it's 
I'm glad I did it, but that was it. <laughs> I, I ran myself so thin on that and so ragged that I wound up, you know, just feeling ill by the time it was done, you know, to play and write and also call the shots was exhausting. You never know, you know. until you try though. So <laughs> I don't know how Michael Sweet does it. I think he does it like once every six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he writes and produces or I've never seen anybody write so many records that I can't even keep track of it. You know, he must turn out at least two a year between, you know, George Lynch and him and mm -hmm. him and somebody else. And but uh God bless him. Well, on Off Stand Together, Paul, one of my personal favorite songs is Escape from the Fire. And I know there's keyboards in the beginning, but you want to talk about a hooky song <laughs> that is I'm playing the air drum is when I'm listening to it. I just uh, that is an awesome song. I, I love it too. Uh, that that record, it, like I said, the uh, distribution of it wasn't really, um, it just didn't fall in place. So it, for us, that means it wasn't necessarily blessed, right? But it was extremely blessed in Europe. So I don't think God only exists on one continent. So, right, right. Uh, but it did make it challenging. But that record was so fun to make. I mean, I cut all my guitar parts, including solos, in five days. And that includes all the acoustics, all of everything. And, um, you know, we allotted a lot more time for it. But um, there were so many of those solos that I, I just got the vibe. I was just in it to where he hit record, our producer, Biff Vincent. And I ran it. And, and a lot of it was just off the cuff. And it just went and so I'd do one and I'd look at him and he'd look, go, how do you feel? And I go, I feel pretty good about it. And he goes, I love it. Let's <laughs> move on. So I didn't even do a second take, you know, uh, one of them, I think it's faith, uh, faith's favorite. Um, is it lies in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Streetlight dancer. Rounded oh, the never thought I'd say goodbye. Never thought I'd say goodbye is, is yeah. or I think they call it say goodbye on there, but yeah, they do. yeah. So that was a hit record front to back, just one take. And she, that's her favorite solo I've ever done on any record. And um, I remember Alan Holdsworth, if you guys are mm -hmm. guitar junkies enough yep. to know, he's, he's yep. kind of a, he was Eddie Van Halen's influence, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know he was cutting a record in the same studio and I played it and everything's quiet. And then I, I kind of look up and I go, how was it? And I hear this English guy go, you know, oh man, that was fantastic, mate. And I'm like, well, that's not Biff Vincent. That guy's from <laughs> Hermosa Beach or someplace like that in California. And it was uh, Alan Holdsworth. And so I was like, oh dude, I got to take a break. <laughs> i'm certainly not playing another note <laughs> yeah so um so that record there um guitar wise and and all that was great but escape from the fire we got to give a little bit of that credit to biff vincent the producer and this is where producers are great that song when it was written first was take the fire escape and then it had the you know no need to burn out young take the fire escape and and <laughs> Uh, I know it sounds horrible, doesn't it, uh, to think of it? But Biff goes, "No, no, no, no. That's too much <laughs> stuff. It's it's just not pointy." He goes, "How about escape from the fire?" And so it instantly was like, "That's it." Yeah. So he so he really was the guy that that you know had mm -hmm. that idea. But that's that's the part of producing that's fun, you know, is being mm -hmm. that outside person that goes, "I love what you guys are doing, but let's." do this instead, you know. So, Paul, I know you're you and Les Carlson, you you guys, the band are playing at part two of Immortal Fest. Do you guys have any concerts scheduled before then? I, I know you said you have some stuff after that, I believe, in the fall. But do you have anything upcoming uh, sooner than that? So the uh, main thing is writing the, uh, Les's second record. OK. Um, 
and then deciding what to do, you know, um, that that's going to take a little while because we're in the starting phases right now. We have just some just shells of things. And actually, Joyce has a great idea for a song. I'm super excited to mm -hmm. to write with her. And, and um, but I think we're going to probably spend the, the better part of the next few two, three months doing that then if we go right into recording that's going to be another two three months and then all of a sudden we're going to be at Amortiflas, yeah. you know okay uh, records uh just take a long time you know he'll probably do a kickstarter to kind of see what kind of budget we're working with sure. okay but uh sure. yeah that's kind of kind of it you know hopefully um because we're scheduled to do germany in uh, september um then when is immortal fest is this September it's, as well? Yeah, it's October 30th through September the 1st, Paul. Okay, it's right so... It's the end of August. Yeah, so we're more than likely going to be middle of September in Europe mm -hmm. and then go to Immortal Fest. So we'll have kind of close ones there and then hopefully have a few... Uh, we'll have had time to actually play some shows versus mm -hmm. having these really far spread apart sure. type of things. But okay. you know my schedule. How hard is it for us to do this interview? Yeah. Imagine right. trying to book me in a gig. That's it. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So where can fans connect with like Wes? And I don't know if you have a Facebook page or something, Paul, where can fans connect with you and Les Carlson? Um, yeah. So uh, at Polly Jacks for Instagram, I, I do most of my stuff on Instagram. Okay. Um, Facebook, I'm really horrible about posting. So you'll see a lot of stuff maybe with, you know, or Shih Tzu Dog or, you know, some sure. golf course or something like that uh but that that that's kind of it um mm -hmm. so okay. uh I, that that's probably the easiest way to get hold of me is is instagram So, Paul, what words of wisdom or encouragement would you like to say to all your friends and fans out there? Um, just continue to grow your relationship with with Christ. Um, my son uh, that was in a horrific motorcycle accident uh, was pronounced dead on the scene. Um, he wasn't. I mean, because they they got him into uh, they didn't you know, actually turn the ambulance sirens on. They just put him in, and they were taking him to a hospital that doesn't even have a trauma. They figured they were just going to take him, and he was going to go to the morgue, you know. And so somewhere along the line, I guess somebody noticed he was breathing, and so they got him rerouted to a place with trauma, uh, a trauma center. And he right now has had four surgeries. I'm still in the hospital. Um, he hasn't quite come out yet as far as uh, his he's still unconscious, but um, his vital signs are good and they're going to start reducing his medication uh, so he can um, start becoming awake again. But people, it's it's a real thing, you know, just keep the faith, uh, believe um, and just stay close, have your personal relationship. Don't get lost in a bunch of stuff where you can blame it on a, a bad pastor or a or a hokey church or somebody who's not you know reaching the the meat and potatoes you know if that's if they're not giving you and feeding you go to another one mm -hmm. don't go go, go there because it's close to your house <laughs> but uh that's that's it for me is um i've seen some miracles and i just saw this one mm -hmm. uh with our son so and, and, and we'll continue to pray for him paul Thank you. I appreciate you guys. I, I love you both. And I, and I really you. appreciate you uh, being here and, and wanting to talk and, mm -hmm. and call me anytime. If you got anything going on, you just want to talk, shoot me a call because, because we're friends. So. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we always close out every episode, Paul, with something we call message from home. And mm -hmm. as Ken always says, we want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And uh, I usually read a, a scripture verse um and so um the scripture uh, come i am gonna read um you know it comes i think of the band's name with the scripture 
and Jesus is speaking here, and it's Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 28, and it's the, you know, the Last Supper, um, and verse 28 reads, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I just want to say Jesus' blood is the way to eternal life with God. And we just want to thank all the members of Blood Good past and present and all the members of Les Carlson's band. And I just want to thank you guys for promoting the good news out there. And, and as you said, Paul, this is a really crazy world anymore. And if, if ever a time to, to be doing this now is definitely the time. And um, I just want to thank you again, Paul, for taking the time um, today and, and talking with us. And um, it's always good seeing you in person at Immortal Fest. And I can't wait to do it again this year, Paul. I look forward to seeing you guys. So are both of you going to be able to make it? Uh, I, live, I live way down south, buddy. So. <laughs> well, I'll just have to come to you then, bud. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you for All your right. time, Paul. We appreciate yes, you. Thank you. And your also, hearts. Yeah. if you if you just hang on here, we're going to close out now. But friends, thank you. And uh, Paul, again, thank you for your time. And we'll see everyone later. Take care, everybody. I just want to say thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, being like an octopus with all those CDs. And hey, this one was, it was pretty, it was, it was like uh, uh, heavy metal flashcards. <laughs> <laughs> There's a light that keeps us guarded, it never goes away. And the strength of our salvation grows stronger every day. There's a place called Trent.